All right. This is called No Man's Laughter out of the book The Neon Wilderness by Nelson Algren. 19 whorls on the index finger, a spiral on the thumb, no regular address, pick up for investigation. That was Gino Bomagino to the auto theft detail. He gave the detail trouble before he was 12. When he was hauled out of a stolen truck, he had crashed into a parked Pontiac on Mother Cabrini Street. He was wearing a pair of women's high-heeled pumps, no stockings, and a pair of man-sized overalls that fitted him like an awning. If it hadn't been for the pumps, he assured the detail, they'd never have gotten him. He couldn't run in them, and admitted when pressed that he'd picked the pumps out of a Goose Island dump and stolen the overalls. They quit school, quote, because the kids pointed on me, unquote. His small chin jutted, warning the officers they'd better not point either, while his hair, which was red, hung angrily before his eyes. I'm one hood don't like getting caught, he explained solemnly. I don't like hanging around the house, neither, because Nicky and Carlo and Steve sleep on top. It developed that he meant on top of the bed, because they were older, while he slept underneath. His terrier's face lit up. I wanted to take a ride somewhere. I can drive like hell. And paled with rage when the officers snickered. They turned him over to juvenile detention, and somehow or other he grew up. By the time that happened, they wished they had mugged and printed him six years before at juvenile or he certainly could drive like hell. Within those six brief years, the red-headed fledgling found wings. The more time he had to get anywhere, the sooner he arrived. When Jeannie, who loved him, asked what the hurry was, he would reply, The faster I go, the safer I feel. I feel like I'm getting somewheres. The brothers used to eat before me at home because they were bigger, and a juvenile was worse, always getting shoved back to the tail of the line. When I got out, it seemed like everybody in the world was all trying to push me off the curb. When I get behind a wheel, though, that's when I pass them all up. That's when I get the world beat. When the cops start chasing, that's even better, because after I get away, I feel like nobody will ever catch me, and ain't nobody caught me yet. When they do, it'll be too late, Jeannie warned him. Too late for what? Too late to start sleeping nights and going to work days, Gino. That's the only safe way. I don't play nothing safe, he told her, then turned it off into a joke and made her forget her fear. Because sometimes, Jeannie liked to drive fast, too. There was the afternoon that the squad spotted him wheeling idly back and forth around the northwest entrance to Humboldt Park and forced him to the curb. Gino waited for them, grinning, then slammed into reverse and wheeled into the scrub bounding the park zigzagging between trees and crashing bushes onto the winding park boulevard. They didn't come that close again for a year. Then, in the early morning dark, a gray sedan passed a streetcar on the wrong side at Polk and Halstead. There were three men in the auto, which resembled one used earlier in the evening in two tavern robberies. The squad car followed it, firing for a mile eastward on Decoven Street, just east of Clinton, the driver, the driver ran up over the curb, swerved around in a hairpin turn on two wheels, and headed back west, narrowly missing the squad car. By the time the officers had turned the car, the other was out of sight. In the same week, police spotted him in the loop going north on LaSalle. The bridge was up at Wacker, but Gino didn't falter. He wheeled the car down through the streetcar tunnel, bumping over the wooden ties, and showed up for one moment before vanishing again on Hubbard Street across the river. I'm a guy like this, Gino explained to Jeannie. I like anything against odds. I don't like nothing safe. I'm a guy like this, too. I don't like getting caught, but mostly I'm a guy like this. I don't like getting laughed at. He lived as he drove, as he gambled, and as he loved, for keeps, taking no man's laughter, and letting the small stakes go. The next time the detail spotted him, he was brandishing a 38 blue steel in a backroom bookie on West Chicago Avenue, 
He had 15 men flat on their faces on the floor, and his hair seemed bristling under his cap. They took him from behind, struggling until he was crying, weakly and desperately. Who are all these guys making half a grand a week and me not making a crying dime, he demanded to know in the wagon. He refused a lawyer that time. His defense was far-fetched, but brief. He decided to stand or fall by it, and he fell. Some guy run past me just as I come in to make a little bet and stuck that gun in my hand, so I just thought I'd see how everybody looked laying down, that's all. He got six months in the worky for that one and came out mean, a closed-mouthed fighting cock with a bitter grin and a trick of keeping his fists doubled at his sides, as though any passing stranger might prove a citizen dress man straight from the gun bureau. Nineteen whorls on the index finger, a spiral on the thumb, no regular address, pick up for investigation. When the mailman dropped his neighbor's greetings into Ginny's mailbox, Gino threw the notice away. They had to come and get him. Ginny was worried then, but Gino had it down for the biggest laugh in the books. He kitted his way through his physical until he saw that he really meant it. Then he told the doc, I got bad teeth. That's all right, he was assured. We don't want you to bite them, Japs. Then he saw the police record attached. There were no federal offenses. You wouldn't steal anything in the Army, he flattered Gino. Gino pointed to the steam radiator in the corner of the office. You see that radiator there, he asked. Yes. You step out for five minutes, and I'll take it home under my coat. And the doc thought he was being kitted. Two days later... Gina was handed a carbine and asked whether he had any experience with guns. No, Gino answered, plain safe. I've been afraid of them things all my life. But he did admit to a knowledge of things which make automobiles run fast. Then maybe you can learn what makes airplanes fly, he was told. And he learned to stick so fast it was shocking. Though he didn't get along even with his own uniform at first. Later he took a sneaking pride in it. He was never able to bring himself to salute as though he meant it. He made each salute smack faintly of nose-thumbing and remained forever on the defensive, forever bristling at fancied insults and always turning a casual ribbing into an open challenge to be settled openly and without compromise. A stretch in the stockade only set him brooding on his wrongs and served to convince him that even here he must remain forever on the outside of everything except the nearest brig. He had belonged to nothing save to the car he happened to be wheeling and Jeannie. In similar fashion, he attached himself to the first plane to which he was assigned and named the plane to himself, secretly, Jeannie. He learned to stay out of trouble by spending his days over the engine and his nights over the stick, avoiding his messmates as sedulously as they had learned early to avoid him. They had him down for a humorless runt too mean to fool with. Once he became so lonely that he started a letter to Jeannie, but the effort blunted the edge of his loneliness, and the letter was never finished. You're the best damn mechanic in this outfit, his pilot conceded reluctantly as a simple statement of fact. If you can fly like you can fix, you'll have your rating in a month. Gino grunted. The fellow talked as though he were saying something that no one else knew. Wasn't he, Gino? The best wheelman on the near northwest side? You're mad at the whole world, the pilot went on, and maybe you've got good reason. But if you forget your grudge, you'll fly that much sooner, and that much better. Gino looked him up and down. When I'm ready to fly, I'll fly, he assured his man. When I'm ready, I'll take the stick. The hell with the rating. The hell with you. It was the longest speech any man in the field had heard him make. They joked of it in barracks for a week. Gino may have softened with time, but before the softening process had set in, he had a letter from Jeannie. Gino, I know you won't blame me for what I got to say, but it's time for me to start playing it safe, even if you don't want to. You know the old saying, absence makes the heart grow fonder for somebody else. Well, I got married at St. John's Sunday morning. You don't know the fellow, but I bet you'd like him. He got picked up once for driving a horse and wagon without lights. Stay as sweet as you are. 
I bet I'd like him too, Gino reflected moodily and tore up the note with deliberation. Sometimes a soldier sort of finds himself up there, the pilot philosophized vaguely to his bombardier without mentioning any particular soldier you might name. Sometimes if a soldier with something twisted up inside him gets off the earth alone with it, he untwists a little. Gina was on a night scouting detail over the Aleutians the week after the fall of Bizert when, in his own fashion, he untwisted himself. Returning to his base in a single-seater, flame in the sky told him he was riding into more than a sunrise. He flew directly into it to conceal himself and saw the great low-lying cruiser with the rising sun on the stern slipping back out to sea, leaving a long line of installations in flames. Gino swung out to sea after it, like the feeling of being, just this one time, the hunter instead of the hunted. There wasn't anything he could do with the crate he was wheeling up there, except to keep the cruiser's movements relayed back to his base long enough to bring up, bring up a couple of the big boys. He hung on just out of range, between the sunrise and the sea, pretending that he was cutting the cruiser off to the curb, as life and the auto theft detail had so often cut him off. The cruiser's anti-aircraft battery got its data together as soon as he appeared off stern, before the pounding of feet on the iron ladders had ceased. It pleased Gino, hopping from cloud to cloud, to know that the great guns being manned below were being manned for no one more important than a petty larceny punk from West Chicago Avenue. Across the bottomless Alaskan sky, he flittered, leapfrogging the clouds parallel with the cruiser's course into the ice-green sky ahead, were streaming back into the blaze of the morning sun. He kept the gun crews in their places like groups of statuary, cursing the Yankee who didn't have sense enough to understand that he couldn't keep hanging in the sky all day like a kite. And all that ice-green forenoon, the kite hung on, calling for help that never came, and wheeled on into the green Alaskan dusk. When fog came suddenly down over the sea, and the cruiser was only a dim gray blur in the endless grayness. He called on his reserve tank and came down on her tail, following her by the wake of the waves, and would not let go and go home. The stakes were too big for Gino to quit. He had played every game for keeps, and this was the biggest game of all. He believed in his luck, he believed in his wheel and his stick, and what no other man had yet believed in, himself. Like waking from a dream, the fluttering needle told him he wouldn't be going home, and fancied he heard light mockery then from the decks below, high, taunting laughter, and the guns pointing like a jeer. Like that first time, so endlessly long ago, when the bigger boys had pointed on him, and came in low, with act act taunting him on, to drive the single-seater through the cruiser's wall like a locomotive through a barn. Then... Crippled and trapped forever in a fever of swimming pain, he felt with a single leaping flame of joy the first great explosion on the deck above, and felt himself wheeling easily through the brush of a land at once strange and familiar, zigzagging numbly down an ever-narrowing way, with the roar of the L overhead and his last, last swift pursuer hard upon him, and realized in one last blind swing of that last pursuit that he was coasting gently downhill at last, toward a land where he'd be unpursued forever. They must have made him mad, the pilot observed thoughtfully to the bombardier, watching the great cruiser floundering in her own flames below. He must have thought some monkey on the deck was laughing at that crate he was wheeling. <laughs>